we see the old disappear and a newness come. And we talked about different miracles in his ministry, and we talked about how we even see that in, in the renewal and the restoration of all things. Uh, when Christ comes on the scene, uh, he makes all things new. And in this particular situation, what was known is now gone. The old heavens, the old earth have been done away with, and what was uh, to come has arrived. We find ourselves, uh, you know, not in, in this scene yet, but John is seeing this vision of the new that is on the way. And this, again, what, it, what we're talking about in Revelation 21 is completely different from the world that we have always known. And so as we read these scriptures, it is important for us to understand that all we have understood is the old, right? All that we have ever experienced is, uh, regarding the world is the old. Now, praise God for our experience in Jesus that has made us new, amen? But, but what we're talking about is, is something that we've never seen, something that we've never experienced regarding the new heavens and the new earth. It's completely different from the world that we've always known. For instance, one of the things that will change, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I, I find this, as, as I try to ponder this, uh, as, as a fascinating idea, history has ended. And time, at this point in Scripture, is no more. Thank you, Jesus. How much... How much of our life, think, just, just pause for a moment, how much of our life is governed by time? All of it is what I'm hearing. Anybody ever feel pressed or rushed with time? I'm seeing a universal, it was almost like the wave, it kind of started, everybody's like, oh yeah. One of the, the most common responses I receive today, if not the almost universal response I get when running into somebody either at the store or the gas station or, or wherever it might be, how you doing today? Man, busy. Just, all oh, things going every which direction, but busy. It used to be, I'm doing good or I'm doing fine or I'm doing this, and, and Floyd's even pointing it to me. It's, it's the most common... We're always running around. We're always trying to stay ahead of the schedule, trying to uh, uh, you know, stay on time. And, and uh, in this situation... History has ended. Time is no more. I can't even fathom that. Hey, Chris. There you go. The way I think of it is, you know, we all have those moments in life where, where time stands still and we just are in the moment, enjoy the moment. But those are so rare. It's, it's the birth of our children or we're just in the midst of a moment where we just live in it. And that's what eternity will be, where every moment will be living in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, and, and, and we'll segue right into that, because what I want us to understand, something regarding eternity, is when we think of it in our understanding, eternity is time lasting forever, but what eternity truly is, is a place where time never existed. Think about that for a minute. We got it on the screen here. Eternity is a place where time never existed. So before, let's, let's, let's kind of play, just, just think this through. Before Genesis 1-1 records in the beginning, okay, before any of that happened, what, what was? God, okay? As we think about this, and again, this is where our, our limited minds that have only known this world, right, has such a hard time comprehending this, and why, you know, even with, with creation, the scientists would look at that and say, well, well, before, what, what came before God? God has always been, and always will be, and, and eternity is a place where, where time, it just never has existed, and again, I, I think it just, just in that aspect of alone, there's this almost an overwhelming peace thinking that there's coming a day when that busy, 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 rush, rush, rush schedule just simply won't be anymore. Other aspects of that, you know, we consider, 
you know, just, just uh, as we age in life and as we begin to experience uh, the process of bodies breaking down, uh, these things don't last forever. Uh, and and we, we start feeling aches and pains and having situations and all these things that we got to take care of. None of that will be a part of eternity. Uh, come on. I know it. That's what I'm saying. It's like, thank you, Jesus. I wish they had a period of time down there where you had instructions on how to grow old before it crept up on you and stole all of your time away from you and says, I'm here. Deal with me. Yeah. Here's what I want us to consider. Time has a beginning and time has an end. But in the situation that we're going to look at in Revelation 21, all of that has passed. God, who always was and always will be, now resides with us in this new heavens and new earth. Basically, what I really want us to understand, and I pray this, this builds our excitement even more regarding what is to come, is that the eternal existence... Eternal, well, as I said, eternity is much different than the reality that we now live in. And I, and I know we've kind of hit on this in, in studies past. Really, it's, it's, it's beyond our comprehension to know what eternity is going to be like. And I'm thankful for that. I am looking forward to a, a, a reality that looks nothing like this old world as the smoke is billowing outside and as the, come on, as the virus is spreading and the civil unrest. Anybody else with me in that? I am glad this place is not my home. My, they, well, what's the term that they use in real estate now? That uh, forever home. We're looking for our forever home. We're looking for our, 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 our place to sit. I see smiles. Did I say something funny back there? I did. Anyway, so, so anyway, but, but in real estate, you know, uh, these, these TV shows and everything else that are, that are out there, people are looking for that, that place to, to kind of settle down and call their forever home. This earth is not our forever home, church. And I am glad for that tonight, that we get to experience eternity with Jesus Christ and, and God in the new heavens and new earth. What kind of, or what would life be like without time? What kind of stress or pressure would be lifted uh, we could speculate that, uh, uh, you know, just about for the entire night tonight. But I want us to understand the new heavens, new earth will not be like anything we've ever known. And John has given a look at what this eternity in heaven will look like. He's given this vision. And central to this vision we look at today is the new Jerusalem. Remember, Scripture talks about the new Jerusalem uh, in this passage and recall that this is a, a literal city or literally the capital city that came out of heaven from God. It is prominent in the vision as it links the new heavens to the new earth. And the vision is broken down into four different parts that help give us an idea of what to expect in this timeless, eternal existence with God who is now walking among us. That's cool. So first off, we look at its general appearance, the general appearance of the new Jerusalem. And we begin reading in verse 9. It says this, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Now, this vision begins with an angel of the Lord who was once associated with the wrath of of the Lord, and he now calls John to come and see the bride or the wife of the Lamb. John is then taken in the spirit to a high mountain. Why, and this just popped in my head as we were reading this again, why do you suppose John was taken to a high mountain? In this, in verse 10 again, it says, to a, a mountain great and high. Any guesses? 
Well, so you see the whole picture. The eel's going to be uh, like 1,400 miles long and 1,400 miles wide and 1,400 miles high. Right. It'd take a pretty high mountain to see very much of it. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, exactly what Ron was saying, exactly what Jim said. So he can see the whole picture. What we're going to be talking about here tonight, again, is beyond anything we've ever known or seen in this, in this world. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself already, but like verse 11, talking about the brilliance of this city, uh, like that of a precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Nothing like this has ever existed on earth. And G, uh, John is taken in the spirit to this mountain. Now understand that when we see that phrase, in the spirit, this is not referring to just a dream or, or a, an imagined picture. John is transported spiritually to the places listed out in Revelation, and he is seeing what no one else can see without the supernatural aid of the angel. Now as we look at this, John points out, or the angel points out someone that he is going to see, someone who he's going to present in a sense uh, uh, in, this, in this vision. Who is the bride that is being shown to John in this? Believers. Believers, okay? The church. All who have believed in Jesus and remained faithful throughout time. They inhabit the city John is about to see. The new Jerusalem, the city itself, we got this is important. The city itself, the physical city, are you following me, is not the bride, but yet the people who inhabit it or who inhabit it are. Oh, I'm getting tongue-tied tonight. I'm just excited about talking about, what's that? Uh, yeah, anyway, so too little coffee, I think, tonight. But it's the people. It's the faithful. It's those who have taken a stand for Jesus, no matter what. That's the bride. And they have been united with the Son. John, again, is placed on this high mountain. From there, he sees this amazing sight. He begins to describe the city by pointing out, again, uh, uh, the most important truth regarding it, that the glory of God is radiating from this city. The brilliance in this is amazing, church. John likens it to a very precious jewel, like Jasper, as he gazes upon the new Jerusalem. God's glory is radiating brilliantly, brightly through this diamond-like city. It's, it's almost as if a giant light bulb were lowered from the sky. But the light is nothing like that coming from uh, like the sun as we know it in the sky or from a lighting fixture. Church, what we will see in verse 23, the light presented here is literally the light or the glory of the Most High God. That's cool to me. Did anybody see the sunrise this morning? Did anybody catch that? I tried to get a picture. We were coming down, I don't know what street it is, that, that uh, oh, it, 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 it's heading to the high school like the, the front doors of the high school face it there in, in K-Town. And, I mean, it was the sun was just right between the elementary school and I think it's the ag building right there. And, I mean, it was great big. And I guess it's the smoke that's in the atmosphere that was allowing it to show off its colors. And from the bottom, it was like this deep red, and it kind of went to an orange to this bright yellow. And, and again, because of the, the atmospheric uh, disturbance, whatever you want to call it, you're able to look at it and just, just kind of, and we stopped. I put the truck in park and tried to take a picture of it, but it was, it was absolutely beautiful. You know, I, and I told the kids, I said, it's kind of neat to think about that, that that ball right there in the sky is what lights up this, this whole world. And in this situation, as, as powerful as, as our physical sun is right now, in this situation, we're going to see the glory of, of God, like this new heavens and new earth, like nothing our sun could even dream of doing. It's powerful. A jewel or diamond-like city shining brightly with God's glory. What an amazing thing to see. So we see its appearance. Now let's look at its ex external design. We're going to start in verse 12. We're going to read quite a bit right here. And here's where we're going to get the idea of how large this city is. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations. 
and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. He made, uh, he, he, uh, measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as, uh, and, and, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The, walls was made of, uh, uh, the wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, I'm not sure how you say that, agate, is that correct? Uh, The fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, and the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. So in this vision, John sees first a wall. Well, what purpose do walls serve around cities? Protection? Okay, absolutely. The ability to defend themselves. But in the case of the New Jerusalem, they serve as basically the edge or the city limits. The city has specific dimensions, and it can be entered and exited. Now, within these walls are 12 gates. What what is unique about these gates? Solid pearl. Has anybody ever seen a gate made out of a single pearl? Well, maybe like in a a flea circus. Anybody know what I'm talking about with the flea circus, the miniaturized Whatever. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? Please tell me I'm not the only one that's ever seen one of these things with little motorized amusement things and, oh, look at the fleas, right? They weren't really fleas. It was just all imaginary. Am I the only one that's ever? Okay, I must be. Scratch that. So, but, but yeah, the, the idea of a, of a gate made of a single pearl, we can't even begin to fathom. One, I mean, I try to think of what that would look like, but two, the value, the physical value of what that would cost Uh, to produce uh, in in our world today. Each gate had names written on them. These names, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, served to celebrate God's covenant relationship with Israel for all of eternity. The gates are distributed throughout the wall, three gates on each side. Then John notices the 12 foundations to the wall with the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Why do you suppose the names of the twelve apostles would be upon the foundation of this city? What are your thoughts? Well, that's what we believe in. That's that they're the one that started the original word. There you go. The twelve apostles, um, I, I can't think of his name now, Zach. Uh, oh my goodness, what was his last name? He's the uh, Kai Alpha director out at, at Kansas, uh, or KU, excuse me. And he, he was here, I don't know, it was about a year ago, and he made a statement, something I'd, I'd never really had pondered before. But he said, if we have the ability, if we have the technological ability to do this, every one of us in this room would be able to trace our faith all the way back to one of the original 12 apostles. Uh, apostles. That because of their work, because of their ministry, we now have the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. I think that's a pretty cool thing. And not only can that that, that legacy be traced back to the original 12, I wonder wonder what kind of a legacy we leave ourselves for others to pick on. That's just a freebie. Amen? Never underestimate. Never underestimate the impact that you are making in the lives of others. God's word is powerful, church. Amen? And God's Spirit, listen, I I believe this. When He leads us to speak encouragement, when He leads us to speak life, when He leads us to opportunities where we have that that time or that chance to to present Jesus to someone, can I tell you something? In that moment, it may not seem like much. Hello? But never underestimate what God is doing in their heart because of your faithfulness. When God says go, we need to go. 
When God says lead, we need to lead. When God says to, to take a moment and to stop and to pray for somebody or maybe to share a scripture with somebody or, or to speak an encouraging word to somebody, let's be faithful in those actions because, church, listen to me, we, we may never know the difference that we're making in that person's life and the difference that that person might make in the lives around them and so on and so forth. Never forget, these 12 guys were regularly or, or regular, ordinary guys, tax collectors, fishermen, right? Just kind of going about their business, and then came Jesus, and he changed it all. Can I tell you something? We never want to underestimate, again, never underestimate what God wants to do in you and through you. So we see the names of the apostles on the foundation of, of, this, of this scene. Next week, again, we see something interesting. Ron pointed this out a moment ago. There's a measuring of the city that takes place, the length, the width, and the height. This is reminiscent, if you will, of, of the measuring of the millennial temple, as we see in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 3, and the measuring of the tribulation temple in Revelation 11, 1. It signifies what belongs to God. Now, when we do the translation from stadia to miles, the city walls are literally 1,380 miles in each direction. That's huge. Hello? That's huge. The wall itself is 72 yards thick. That's a pretty big wall. The measurements that we see here are literal, not fictional. John isn't, isn't just, you know, kind of throwing out an approximate number here. Did you catch what he said uh, in, in verse 17? The angel measured the wall using human measurement. Now, I find that, that clarification very interesting. This is the first time in Scripture, in, in Revelation, that we see John say, what I am telling you, this is literal. This, I'm not estimating. I'm not approximating. This is how big this city is. Now, again, think of all the things that we have seen happen in, in Revelation. And we've been given specific numbers, you know, like a third or, or, or such, you know, in different things, like the 144,000. But in this, in this case, John makes a point to reiterate this really is how big the new Jerusalem is. And to me, it, it, it's kind of showing that excitement. Hello? It's getting quiet in here. Come on. I, 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 it gets quiet. I get crazy. Come on, you know. David? Heaven, and the angels come and showed him everything. It didn't mean nothing to him. He wanted to see Jesus. Yeah. And I think we get there, all these walls and all these pearls and these gates aren't going to mean nothing. We'll, we'll mess all of them. Yeah, man, David, you are, you are right spot on as far as what I, it, it, the next point here. What, what you know, we, we, we're looking at the, the external design of the city, and again, the construction materials listed here are a little bit, well, we'll call it unique. What do we use to make a building? Concrete, steel, wood, Nails, screws, bolts. Yep, bolts. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. It's, 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 it's what we would call common uh, materials to construct, you know, buildings or houses or, or what have you. And in this, in this case, when John is describing the external design of this new Jerusalem, and we'll stop on this, so see, there we go. We're, we're not able to get to be get through all of this, but I want you to see something. David just pointed this out, and this is huge. Everything listed here as construction elements are things that, honestly, I don't think we would ever dream of using in construction. Everything that's listed here we might keep in a safe or a safety deposit box in, in, in the bank. I mean, if any one of us had a pearl large enough to build a, a solid gate out, let alone 12 pearls, I think we would probably have those stored away somewhere, you know, to use on a rainy day or what. Are you following me tonight? The precious stones and the pearl aren't the highlight of the city. The highlight is Jesus, as David was saying. Amen. Amen. And so everything, 
everything that the city is made of, uh, it, it's construction materials, all, all of this stuff. You know, we're going to be talking about gold so pure that it is transparent. All of that is, is basically nothing. Common, common things in that new jewel. The, the jewel, the gem, if you will, the treasure is Jesus. Amen? It's Jesus. And again, why I think it's so important, and we'll end with this, that at the beginning of this vision, what did the angel tell John he was going to see or be shown? The bride of Christ. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The city is the backdrop right, of this, of this new union with Jesus. Guys, I'm glad to know him tonight. I'm glad that somebody introduced me to Christ, that somebody took a moment to, to stop and, and share with me their faith in Jesus. And I look forward, oh man, I look forward to that day when we're no longer bound by the things of this world as we know it, but we will be in eternity with Jesus Christ, our Savior, in a world that is truly illuminated by the glory of God. Thank you, Lord, for what is to come. Amen? Amen. Lord, bless us tonight as we get ready to go from here. Give us a great, great end of the week. And Lord, again, we pray for this conference. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, keep everybody safe going home, keep everybody safe from the virus. And Lord, keep everybody praising you. Lord, no matter what's going on, you deserve our highest praise. Bless us tonight. And again, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We love you guys. Love you ladies. Have a great week in uh, the Lord. And gentlemen, Friday night, 430. That's when the fun begins. Amen. We'll see you there.